Hey folks, Ashley here, allthingsindustry.com. I had a request by a viewer to see if I had any uh, talk about any impression tips, impression fabrication tips, of making a, a final impression tips. And well, I went around the residency and talked to a bunch of folks. Uh, you can see the list, and this is for uh, taking a fixed impression of a fixed rest for a fixed restoration, indirect restoration. And I checked the literature and some textbooks, so I have a, about eight to ten little tips, hints that uh, have come out that I didn't know before that we've talked about in the residency, and this is a great sort of any, a good way for myself to rem remember as well. So in front of you, you see a whole bunch of different trays and I've got a bunch of different materials sort of spread around. We'll slowly discuss that. And I want to start off by, in one of the, in Summit's textbook, he talks about uh, important concepts. So we talk about four of them. And um, the top one is reproduction accuracy of your impression of the, the tooth that you're taking the impression of or the implant. And one of the th one little tip is to think about uh, the adhesive that you're using. Uh, are you using adhesive on your trays, something like this, um, to retain the impression? And also the type of tray that you're using for that's indicated for what you're trying to accomplish. I'm not going to get into an opinion-based discussion about cus um, custom tray versus stock tray versus um, triple tray or dual arch. This is just for you to think about. Um, second important concept is the viscosity of the impression material that you're using. Uh, we're doing a dual phase technique where it's sort of a light, uh, low viscosity material to flow around the abutments and then followed up uh, by a, a heavy, medium heavy body uh, material. Third one is the impression technique. Essentially, how are you doing the impression technique? And one of the, one problem we always have, and you can see even here, there's a bubble right on the margin. Um, one tip from Dr. Dre was in his experience, especially going around with uh, whatever impression tip you're using. Hopefully we'll be gone by the wayside with optical impressions. We're going to be talking strictly about analog, and I should have mentioned that in initially. So uh, E4D, CEREC, down the road, hopefully we're going to go with more of those optical impressions, so we need to do away with all this material. But for the meantime, we're kind of here. So for example, using some sort of tip like this, and what Dr. Dre is saying is that just keep your foot on the gas. Dr. K mentioned rehearsal, uh, intro orally rehearsing, going around the tooth a few times, say three to four times, just rehearsing, because sometimes you're using it on the end of uh, a large impression uh, gun, gun, or you may be using a, a small syringe. In both techniques, you're still going around the tooth, so practicing sort of keeping this, keeping the foot on the gas and not stopping to change the angulation. And Dr. Dre suggests, was thinking that perhaps just changing the angulation as you go around the tooth may induce uh, capturing a little bit of air. Again, limited studies on, on these little things, so it's just little tips. So rehearse, keep the foot on the gas, a couple little tips there. And then the last one, that which is really significant and it's recommended it's suggested that primary reason for not adequately capturing marginal detail is deficient gingival displacement so packing cord so tissue essentially tissue management we're going to discuss uh, a couple ways that have been shown and sort of the techniques I'm not going to get deep in the weeds because I would take a long we're not talking about a lecture here so more on tissue displacement it's recommended that to have 0.2 to 0.4 or greater than 0.2 millimeters of sulcular width for an accurate impression. And Lofer and et al. in 1996 uh, found that 50% of impressions with 0.8 to 0.15 millimeters of width had defects and all the impressions had a high prevalence of tears when the sulcus was less than 0.5 millimeters. Now, what it, what, how does that make a difference? Why does that matter? Well, really now we're talking about a balancing act between the tear strength, so how easy, easy is it to tear this material, and the dimension of stability when the material is at a tiny, thin, you can see here in that margin, when it becomes really thin. And we're also balancing between plastic deformation as this 
material comes out of an undercut, how well does it um, retain its elastic elastic deformation and go back to its original shape versus being plastically plastically deformed and not going back to its original shape. So when they were talking about 0 0.2, greater than 0 0.2, they had the minimum amount of defects in the marginal discrepancies. So if this was, if this little, what we're talking about, the sulci, you can see this is the impression material going into the sulcus. Uh, when it was less, probably in a region like that, you're gonna have more defects. Let's see if I can zoom right in on that. So a region like here, pretty minimal compared to uh, sulcus here. Hopefully you can see what I'm talking about. So there's a number of ways we can displace tissue um, in a lateral and vertical, a horizontal and vertical displacement. There's mechanical, just using uh, cord. So we typically, now it's suggested uh, through the lit, especially for that one um, study by Lofer, talking about using a cord, using a, th a dual cord technique, a thin little one like a triple O. I'm not even gonna discuss the types, whether it be knitted or braided. We're just gonna talk about the size and a larger size. So that goes on top. This bottle's getting old. A larger size there, a medium size cord. You can do chemi mechanical chemical, so using the cord, but also some sort of astringent. There's a whole wide range of different chemicals you can use. That's aluminum chloride, this is ferric sulfate. You can use rotary, electrosurgical laser. According to Summit, he was talking about effective tissue management and so essentially like we were talking about, the tissue must be displaced horizontally sufficiently enough, so greater than 0 0.2 millimeters to provide an adequate bulk of impression material. So I placed some cord on this tooth here as a dual cord technique in my dentiform. It works sufficiently for, an, for a demonstration. Um, he also says, I mean, all gingival bleeding must be arrested. Now that, uh, that's an interesting statement because the, most of these, even though they say they're hydrophilic, these materials, especially polyvinyl siloxane, they're still hydrophobic. And any type of uh, hemorrhage will definitely affect. I've, uh, I think we've all experienced that firsthand. Now, if you can't obtain hemorrhage control, perhaps you need to think about your biological width invasion involvement. Maybe there's not enough sulcus depth and just inflammation from contours of your provisional or damage during preparation. There's a wide range and that's a total another video. And additionally, all the hard and soft, so point number three, all the hard and soft tissues must be dry because this is a hydrophobic material. So cord placement technique, typically we're, we, it's been advocated throughout the literature using a dual cord technique. And one of the things that I was neat that I learned from a few folks was um, during, when do you place your cord and what types of cord? Well, we talked about the, the triple O or a thin little cord. Some folks, uh, like Schillingbird, suggest winding it up to make it winding it up to make it really thin, and then placing it. Um, but when do you place it? Well, this was learning for me. Uh, after you've sort of done your reductions and you're just place your, during your crown margin preparation, so not finishing your, your finish line, but uh, at the start of it, you can take a dry cord, which they, he calls a uh, compression cord technique, or compression cord, and place it in the sulcus. Now I was taught one bizarre way, and it definitely did not work. Now what I've learned now is that if you just take it, let me zoom out here, take it in your hands, or with a hemostat or whatnot, sort of loop it, place it under and then pull and what happens is the height of contour if you can capture it you can even probably do this before remember you have to take in consideration if you do place this and you do have an astringent in on it it may affect um, the vascularity if say greater than four, 20 minutes uh, that may cause necrosis of your uh, supporting tissues so if you place it dry without any sort of uh, astringent on it that's definitely probably a, a better way of doing it uh, in this technique. So whether or not you're doing this before you even started your crown preparation or just after you've some, sort of done the bulk removal of tooth structure, uh, you can place it. So taking your one finger and just slide it down. Now I'm going to use my finger 
just to show you that as you capture that slide it underneath the height of contour it goes into the sulcus and we want this to be at the bottom of the sulcus and then like your regular impression technique take your cord packing instrument and there's thousands of different styles of cord packing instruments this is by no means uh, any a decent one and then just place it in snip it off so these two ends abut abut or join together and go into the sulcus and that way you've now started the um, deflection of the gingival technique. So after the so once you finish your crown preparation and then the finish line is finished, then take your uh, what they call what he calls a deflective cord or the larger cord, at least a medium cord. Place it in your astringent material and then pack that. And that needs to sit for the lit show, literature shows four to six minutes for adequate horizontal displacement of greater than 0.2 millimeters. So like I said, four to six millimeter minutes, the cord has to sit, the deflective cord, the one at the uh, top of the sulcus. And of course, there are a whole different wide range of, like I said, different types of cord. Don't go by what I have here. Uh, go by what the literature suggests. What's good in your hands. Some folks use cotton rolled in a, in a little string. Um, there's all different types.